Amen. Pastor Mike. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Good morning, church. So we are continuing in our sermon series today. We've been tracking through Hebrews chapter 13 in a sermon series we've called Live Small. And the whole thrust behind this is that we would focus in on what God has called us to be faithful to. Hebrews 13 has, there's a lot going on in this one chapter. And the writer of Hebrews is very intentional in how he worded things in this letter to the church from a couple thousand years ago that has direct relevance to us today. So this morning, we're going to talk about leadership and the leadership specifically in the church. And the irony is not lost on me that here you have a, a very flawed leader speaking to you about leadership in the church. Let's dive right in because, well, you'll see, you can find so many better examples of godly leadership than the person that's preaching the message to you. In fact, in recent generations, it's become so much more well known and understood the flaws and the, well, should we say the setbacks and the humanity and the failings of so many in church leadership. So obviously, the place to go to is the scriptures themselves. We do some character studies on great heroes of our faith, and, and I don't mean to be flipping with that at all. But when you dig, and you go into who God called in different times to lead his people and even to lead his church, you'll see a common theme emerge. Just a few examples from the Old Testament and the New. Moses was a murderer and he sinned in anger against God. Jacob deceived his way into his brother's birthright. David, even the great King David himself, was a murderer and an adulterer after having been made king. Solomon, David's son, was obsessed with wealth and power and, should we say, many women, even though Solomon was gifted by God with just extravagant gifts of wisdom. One of the great prophets of the Old Testament, Jonah, directly disobeyed God, a prophetic calling. God told him to go west and he went east. And the story of Jonah plays out from there as God calls him back to his ministry. Matthew, the tax collector, more than just a tax collector, he actually cheated his own people out of money. Even being one of the 12. And then Paul, before his name was Paul, was Saul. He rounded up Christians and had them persecuted and killed. You see the pattern emerging here in any conversation that we have about church leadership. It needs to begin with a very important point. That sometimes I think we forget. God uses normal, flawed, ordinary men and women to lead in extraordinary ways. Leaders in the church are not perfect. The leaders in the church have this high calling. You see, there is a high calling and an account to give for those who aspire to church leadership. I had a mentor once early in my days of ministry. He told me the one thing he always tells interns, or seminary students, people that are looking to go into formal ministry as their vocation, he tells them, don't do it. Tries to talk them out of it. Now he's a little bit flipping with that. The context for that is, don't do it unless you're willing to selflessly devote your life to the calling that God places on your life. Any demonstration of leadership in God's church is so much more a testament to the grace of God at work within normal, ordinary human beings than it is about the leader themselves. Leadership in the church is about the power of God and the power of the gospel to transform as we lead this church. You see, the church, the mission of the church has gone forward for 2,000 years years and God has used very imperfect people and broken vessels to literally change the world in ever changing ways as pastor Paul just described as we prayed over this mission's focus of the church the mission of God continues to go forward there are many scriptures that we can look to 
that you piece together, especially in, in the New Testament, that form almost puzzle pieces of what I would call sort of a job description of people that are in church leadership. And I want to focus in on just one of those passages before we get to Hebrews 13. One of those scriptures is found in 1 Peter chapter 5. The words will be on the screen here. Peter says these words. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I love these verses because it underscores the gravity of what it means to be in church leadership. And just so we're clear, you see in this passage, it talks about elders. And we have elders here at the church. There are a number of church offices that, depending on the church and the governance of that church, are outlined in the Bible. Whether it's pastors or elders or evangelists or missionaries or deacons or deaconesses or prophetesses, there are many offices in scripture outlined for church leadership. And I highlighted the word shepherd here because you don't see the word pastor, do you? Well, if you do a quick study of the Greek, the word pastor is formed from the word shepherd. It's not a, a direct translation, but it's where the word pastors come from. In the Greek, poimeno is where we get the word pastor. It's taken from the word shepherd. You see the correlation there. Why is this important? Because as a pastor, as church leadership in pastoral ministry, we take seriously the metaphor of what's being talked about in 1 Peter and in other parts of the Bible. Shepherd the flock under your care. There's a gravity to that that we all aspire to in leadership and ministry, but it is one that you do not enter into flippantly or lightly but very soberly out of reverence for God. So all that, I think, is a necessary backdrop to the passage that we have before us today. You see, we've been going through Hebrews chapter 13, and I have a few verses for you. They're scattered throughout that chapter, but I want to focus them in for us today. And let me read to you these verses from the writer of Hebrews. It says, Remember your leaders... Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. This is God's word to his church. Yes, it was written a couple thousand years ago in a specific context to a Hebrew congregation, but it was also very applicable to the church all time. And that's why we come to this, work, this sermon series, Live Small. There's practical words here and powerful words that hopefully challenge our faith to get us to live within what God has called us to. Sometimes we, we sometimes overcomplicate our faith and Hebrews here brings us back to some of the basics. So I wanna focus in first on verse seven. We're gonna go through the whole passage here, but verse seven is something specific, I believe, to, to get us into this mode of what does it mean to even honor church leadership and why is that even important? So to focus in on verse seven, the writer says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. 
Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. A couple of things that we see right at the beginning here is not talking about general leaders in society and life. The, the connotation here is those who spoke the word of God to you or who speak the word of God. That's how we know it's talking about specific Christian ministry in the church. And the writer of Hebrews has some words to us here. The first thing he challenges us with is remember them. That's an interesting way to start this. Most commentators are agreed that the people being referred to here are either some of the first planters of this congregation or that he's talking about those who have de deceased, passed on already. He's challenging the church. He's remember those people who brought you the word of God, whether it was a pastor, an elder, a deacon, a, an evangelist, a missionary. We don't know. But the calling is, the challenge to our faith is to remember them. You know, as I was thinking through this message, I'm reminded of the person that first spoke the word of God to me in church leadership, not the faith of my parents. The first pastor that spoke the word of God to me was Lexington, Massachusetts, in the church I grew up in as a kid. In, in the greater Boston area, uh, the church Grace Chapel took great prominence. It was the church I was dedicated in as a baby in the mid-70s. I know I'm dating myself. But it took great prominence. It became one of the first mega churches in New England in the Northeast. In the 1980s, that church rose to a, a real prominence under the leadership of Gordon McDonald. He was the pastor there for a number of years. And even now, as I think about it, I remember his words. I remember how he preached. He's still with us, by the way. He's not in active ministry anymore. But I can remember this man speaking the word of God to me at the earliest of ages from when I was a kid. And it's not, the calling here is not just to do that out of nostalgia, but it's to do that out of a sense of purpose and understanding of who the leaders in the church are and why they speak the word of God to us and the meaning that that then has in our lives as we are responsible for our own faith journey. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, consider the outcome of how they lived. Now that's an interesting one, especially in my situation. As I grew up under Gordon MacDonald and his pastorate and his teaching, uh, it's widely known in a lot of evangelical circles that Gordon MacDonald had a moral failing back in the day. So when I consider the outcome of how he lived, it's complicated. But the writer of Hebrews here is not looking at us and telling us as the church, consider how this man lived in every single aspect of his life and take copious notes and make sure that you hold him accountable for everything that he did in his past, negating everything that God did in the redemption story of his ministry. I can tell you that Gordon MacDonald, after he left ministry because of that, spent years repairing his life and his marriage. He then returned to the pastor to that church started to disciple me in my early days of ministry. My first job as a youth pastor was under his leadership. God did an amazing work in restoring him, not to dismiss or excuse anything that happened in his life. Those in church leadership, there's an accounting that we give to God. When it says shepherd the flock, as we read earlier, that's an honor for us. Is something that we all take very seriously. But there's a reason why Moses is not remembered as a murderer. There's a reason why even King David, is, he wrote so many of the Psalms, and we read one this morning in our call to worship, that his moment of adultery and infidelity and murder did not define his existence. God still worked through him not to dismiss what happened. There's a reason why Jonah, the book of Jonah is included in the books and the pages of the Bible, even though he disobeyed God dramatically. There's a reason why Saul had his name changed to Paul and then went on to be the great missionary and evangelist, wrote so much of the New Testament itself. 
When it says consider the outcome of how they lived, the calling for us is to look at those in church leadership and look at the wholeness of what God does through their life. Yes, holding them accountable. There is a standard for all of us. But understanding God will always use broken vessels to move the mission of the church forward. And finally, it says here, imitate their faith. This is a curious phrase, imitate their faith. It doesn't mean imitate every aspect of their life. The apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians has a little bit of a different take on this. He said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. The calling for us as the church is to look at church leaders, understanding it's not about them, it's about them following Christ. It's about imitating their faith. It's about looking at the wholeness of a person in their life and their ministry and knowing that God The power of the gospel is at work through normal, flawed, ordinary sinners, just like all of us. This is how the mission of the church moves forward. But there's more. There's more. I want to take you to those other verses from Hebrews 13 that we looked at earlier. I want to unpack these verses for you. And there's a little bit of discernment or a lot of discernment that we need here. Verses 17 through 19 Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. There's a lot happening in these verses. If you're okay, let me just take a few moments. There are three things I want you to see from these verses. And we're going to dive right into them. The first, the the words just sort of leap off the page. It's almost like they're in neon here. Obey and submit to your leaders. Obey and submit to them. They're keeping watch over your souls. All right, Pastor Mike. Who in the world do you think you are? Isn't it a little arrogant for you to stand up there? Some of you in this room and watching online, some of you have the ability to say, young whippersnapper, who do you think you are? You haven't lived enough life yet. How am I going to obey and submit to you and your leadership? And why, who do you think you are to tell me that? Well, let's talk about that. (laughs) Obeying and submit are always to be understood in scripture in context. It's not a declaration because I have the office of pastor or because our elders have the office of elders, because I have a degree in my wall, that means that automatically you need to obey and submit to me and my leadership. Those things are earned. Ministry is done in the context of relationship. I love this church. And I'm honored to have been here for over three years now. Ironically, I started in the pandemic. I mean, as soon as the world shut down and we went virtual is when I started my ministry here. So sadly, I realized, I actually realized that there are people that are part of this congregation that I've never met. That we are connected this way, but I haven't met you in person yet. It's an honor to be among you. So to obey and submit is always done in the context of relationship and an understanding of the text here. Because they are keeping watch over your souls. I don't know if I have the ability to communicate the gravity of those words to you. All I can do is tell you with integrity. Speaking of the leadership structure we have here at Loudonville, your elders, your pastors, the leaders of this church, Take very seriously the care and nurture and watching over your souls. Think of the analogy of a shepherd. Each sheep is responsible for their individual walk for their life. Each person is responsible for our lives, to steward our lives under Christ. But even as I look at this congregation right now, I know because I've begun to walk with some of you. Pastor Paul and Pastor Carl can say the same thing. 
keeping watch over your souls doesn't command your obedience or submission. It communicates, hopefully, to you the gravity, the calling that God has placed in our lives and the humility that we lead in because there is an accounting, as the scripture says. There is an accounting that leaders will give to God and don't think for a second that is lost on us. That's why I started the sermon with biblical examples of, well, sinful leaders. Guilty as charged. I am as flawed as any of you. So why would I ever say follow me? Follow me, not because I'm me or there's anything special about me. Follow me because I follow Christ and do so imperfectly, but I've dedicated my life to it, not just my ministry, not just my vocation. We dedicate ourselves to it, understanding that there is an accounting that leaders will give to God and understanding our role in that. There's a mutual submission here. And you'll see this play out later. You will never see leaders in this church, past or present or future, that obey and submit because we have a degree in our wall. Because we're a family, a church family, and this is what God has called us to. So much more I can say, but I want to move on. Number two, the second thing I want you to see is as we nurture and care and watch over the flock that God has given us, the command of scripture is to let them, being the church leadership, let them do this with joy, not with groaning. Well, this is a whole separate sermon here. <laughs> I'm going to look at my notes. I'm not going to make eye contact with anybody here because I don't want, I don't want you to think I'm like pointing at you. <laughs> but to be serious with this, when we... I'm going to use my quotation marks. When we come to work, we do so with a clear purpose in mind. It's not about, hey, make us happy so we're joyful. We take joy in being shepherds over God's flock, but also in the mission of the church. The mission of the church is the priority. It is the reason we get up in the morning. It is the reason why we live the calling of God as called us to. It's what Pastor Paul referenced earlier today, talking about the focus that we've just had in the world of missions. That's one area of the greater mission of God. We take joy in that mission. But I got to be honest with you, if you. Go to the next slide. The unity of the church fuels the mission of the church. I'm going to say that again. The unity of the church fuels the mission of the church. We want to maintain unity, and that's not uniformity. Anytime you're in a non-denominational setting with a few hundred or more people in the room, you're going to have differences of opinion of this is how the church should be organized and run and the priorities and the values and all of the things that we bring to it. And there's a whole 1 Corinthians 12 context to it. There are many parts to one body. We celebrate those diversities in the church God has called us not to be uniform in everything, but God has called this church to unity in all things. That is rocket fuel for the mission of the church. So you might understand the other part of that coin. The other side of that coin is that when there's disunity, it takes us away from our mission. And we don't actually groan most of the time. But when there's disunity... And I'm going to use the word infighting. When the church is distracted from its mission because we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves, it's easy, easy to see. Well, that's not just discouraging and we lose our joy from that. Again, it's not about us. It's about him. But it's easy to see how the enemy can just swoop right in and take us away from the mission that God has called us to. Your staff of this church, your pastors, the elders of this church, and so many other forms, uh, the volunteer leaders, some of the boards and committees and teams that are here, we are all take this very seriously. We are all about seeing the mission of God move forward, but to, in order to do that, we need unity in the church. That is your cue for a resounding amen. 
Good. Third thing that's here. Pray for us. The calling of scripture, verse 19 is pray for us. It's not just submit and obey. It's pray for us. Because there's a greater goal here. In honor, we want to serve God faithfully. The text, the writer of Hebrews speaks to this. We know we have a clear conscience and we want to serve him honorably, faithfully. So the call is to pray. Yes, pray for your church leadership. Why is this so important? It's not just about the unity of the church and the mission of the church. It's important because there is an enemy seeking to destroy the church. He's been trying for a couple of thousand years. He's been unsuccessful so far. Part of the reason for that is because the power, real power of prayer. Pray for your church leadership. We are not perfect. We are sinners like the rest of you. There's, I think, maybe a cultural standard from generations ago where church leaders are just put on this, well, play with words, this ungodly pedestal that they shouldn't be on. There's humility that needs to be involved in church leadership. And we seek to live that out. That's why we want you to pray for us. That's why we want you to not submit and obey out of an obligation, but because we're a family, a church family that God has called for great things because the stakes are so high, because we have a mission to do. So if you can understand and discern this text from Hebrews 13 today, hopefully you understand that God has orchestrated leadership in his church through many different avenues, not just the office of pastor or elder. But when the church is organized in certain ways, the mission of God goes forward when we live this out as his church. I'm gonna share with you just one more text today before we wrap things up. This is one of my favorite texts I personalize this for me in ministry. I've always seen this as this is what a pastor is about. It's not exhaustive. It's not, this is a portion of it. But God keeps speaking to me through this and hopefully he can speak to you through this. Familiar passage from 2 Corinthians 4. This is why the text that we read today and the topic of honoring church leadership, this is why it matters. You ready? Let me just read this for you. Therefore, Having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In the case, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'm gonna ask, even, even for our online audience, if, if uh, this next slide, I'm gonna ask, just keep it up here for a little bit. Because the word of God just spoke, but I just want to do it in shorthand version here. Uh, keep this slide up. Ministry is given as a gift from God. If you follow a pastor that doesn't see it as a gift, it sees it as theirs, you need to start running away. Ministry belongs to the Lord and it is a gift from him. We, 
have renounced underhanded pride and twisting God's word. Every aspect of this church is organized and brought under the lordship of Christ and his word. Every ministry, every curriculum, every part of this church here in Loudonville, in Albany, and around the world, we will not twist the word of God. We will be faithful to living out the word of God, even as imperfectly as we are, we will not twist this. We commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God himself. There is a humility and a vulnerability that exists for a pastor, for those in church leadership. We commend ourselves to all of you before God himself. This is all important, so important and primal to the mission of the church because the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing and there is a war happening that for whatever God's reasoning, he has called us to lead in. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers that they cannot see the light of God, the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we have been inserted into this time, into this context, into this city to change that to take people that are perishing spiritually dead and bring them into spiritual life. It is a calling that we take seriously until our last breath. We will not preach ourselves. You'll hear some goofy stories about us from time to time and we live in the testimony that God has provided for us in the life that we live. But that's not the focus of who we are. We're not in ministry for ourselves, but for God and his glory. If there's a pastor that is in for his own glory, start running the other way. It's about Christ and not us. We are your servants, ministers. Yes, obey and submit to your leaders as the scripture calls us to, but understand that we are your servants. Why is all of this important? I promise I'm almost done. But you know what? 2 Corinthians 4 is is just so incredible. It would be almost sinful for me to just stop it right here. Let me just go the next few verses and then I'll wrap up the message. Verse seven. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Anyone that aspires to leadership in God's church, we recognize we are the jars of clay, those fragile, nondescript jars that contain the truth of God. It's not about us. We're just that outer shell. We're just the jars of clay. The power is from God and not us. And may it always be so. God uses normal, flawed, ordinary men and women to lead in extraordinary ways. We are his church. May we come together as one and let God use us together in extraordinary ways, quite literally, to change the world for the gospel. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask you to continue to move in us, lead us, change us as your church. Lord, may we never just follow someone or or even a group of people blindly. May we follow leadership because leadership follows you. We may be the shepherds that you've called us to, to be, Lord, but you are the chief shepherd. And as you lead your church, I pray that we would remain faithful to the calling that you've given to us, that you would maintain the unity of this church, and that we would always, always seek your leadership in our lives. Thank you for the power of the gospel at work within every aspect of church leadership. We pray for the protection of church leadership.
Father, just as you call us to, we pray for our leaders. Lord, not just their protection, but their provision and your guidance and conviction over us. As broken people in need of a savior, we seek you even as we shepherd. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and worship him.